two k row every five hundred meters neck of pine ne- neck of can yeah <laughs> can and I've got I remember I've seen a bit, I've seen someone either someone puking in the I think Harry might have been puking in the bin and he wasn't even doing it. <laughs> They were less today's, mate. So we give a bit of context. As a, were you dressed as the uh, the jailbird? Then? Yeah, well, I was in jail the night before. Me and, Sarah Rambini, me, me, <laughs> me and the late Sarah Rambini got arrested um, for an oh, altercation that I tried to... Uh, for Kate. Yeah. yeah, you were the goodie. You were always good. the goodie, Jimbo. I know, exactly. So on this episode of Lockdown, I speak to a former teammate of mine, Northampton backs coach Sam Vesti. Sam had a very good career at Leicester. I don't know why I'm speaking like this. I'm trying to be all serious. I'm not. He's one of my good, good mates in rugby. He's done very well for himself. He's thought of as one of the best up-and-coming English coaches in England. I was going to say the world, but it wouldn't make sense. In England. Sam Vesti. Next up on Rugby Pass, it's lockdown. Uh, let's, uh, let's go back a few years, right? Because we played together at Leicester. For the millions of people out there that will watch this... Uh, they wonder where our relationship is from. You're now a coach. I'm now uh, a media... Um, moguls. Yeah, mogul. Moguls the word. Yes, you're right, Sam. So let's just go back to our time at Leicester. Do you, do, do you ever... When you look back at Leicester, how much of a platform has that given you in your life? You know, the career that you had there, both from a player point of view, but personally with the young family as well. Yeah, I, I, I owe it pretty much everything I think I, I've come to get and we've come to have as a family I truly believe that there were some when we came into that environment it was uh, it sort of set all the boundaries that I have as what is expected of a, an athlete and how you should perform and how you should go about your training and um, yeah I, I owe it absolutely I owe that time of my life absolutely everything what do you think on that Jimbo you what do you mate, think of those times? 100%, mate. They, they, Leicester, right, and you know as well, because we've known each other since we were young. If it weren't for them seeing something in me, not just as a player, but I think as a bloke, I don't know what way I would have gone. Prison? I mean, yeah. and, 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 mate, it's not, you know, I'm not being dramatic when I no, would say not. that. No. So, you know, my kind of upbringing, and you know a little bit about it, it's out there in the public domain. But I think the, the people that were at that club, at that time, at that one moment, is uh, is once in a lifetime. You know, so Dino, mm. uh, Dean Richards be, being probably the main influence, but then you look at the characters underneath him and, you know, Cockers was amazing for me, Graham Roundtree, uh, working with the likes of Jono, although I didn't have a relationship like I had with Dino, with, with Jono, but just that group, like even, you know, yourself, um, Harry Ellis, Ollie Smith, the Deacon brothers, you know, Michael Holford. We, uh, as, as a club, it just uh, had everything, didn't it, in terms of yeah. the balance which you'd want there. And we can maybe talk about how the game's evolved, but off the pitch, where we enjoyed it, and you could back then, mm. but also when you rocked up to work and the culture, it was just, the hardest thing for me was how you could go from being one person off the pitch, right? And then once you hit, once you got over the whitewashing trainer again, you're a completely different person. Yeah. It was just crazy, so... When you look back on that time, uh, Bestie, what were some of your fondest moments? I know we've got over a bit of old ground and I don't know how bothered people are, but I'm bothered. So when you look at the <laughs> time there, my, what do you reckon? My fondest moments are, um, a lot of them are um, off the pitch stuff where we just had a lot of fun. Um, uh, you know, I mean, we did some great things on the field and I loved all that, but mate, we had some great times off the field. As you say, we worked hard on the when we crossed the white line, that was very definite, but there was some good fun off it as well. And growing up through the age groups and, um, you know, that they were real fond times, man. You you make some really good friends of that time, don't you? And, uh, you know, I look back on those with real fond memories. I mean, some of the, some of the, some of the drinking sessions were great fun. Some of the games we had where we were in the, managed to get ourselves out of the crap and, win games and some of the training sessions. Like I look, you look back on some of those training sessions where it used to kick off and actually you look back on those fondly now and go flip, you know, they were, they were good times. How much of that kind of culture, because it is so different now, so the mm. going out boozing obviously doesn't really exist anymore, the scrapping in training, like, as in we're not talking handbags, we are talking full-on mass brawls in training. But how much of that and that kind of culture 
can you transfer into coaching? I, th- I think, um, as I say, I think I, what I took from my time then was that was that, that was that spit out lots of people that couldn't take that environment. It created an environment that if you weren't that type of person, there was nowhere to go. You had you either swam or you sank, and if you sank, you just got got rid of you were there for three months and then suddenly gone. That happened to a lot of people, didn't it? Mm. Back in those days, and I think actually a lot of the people it did that to would have been good players. I don't think it's the own, and what I've learned since being away from there is that was one way of doing it. It was a very good way, but it was very much of its time and it was very much of, of the place it was. If um, moving on, you can, you know, some players that wouldn't, wouldn't make it there, but would make it somewhere else and be very, very good players. So there are different ways of doing things. But the fundamentals of you have to be competitive. You have to create a competitive environment where um, people want to beat the other people in that squad. And actually just that makes everyone get that better and better and better. And I think ultimately I take that competitiveness out of my time then at Leicester. And then secondly to that, the culture was um, peer driven. So it wasn't, like I'm um, Jimbo, you've been parts of lots of teams and they go and write things on walls and they go and make lists of things and they do all these things. Actually, at, at that point then, the, we didn't do that. But you knew as soon as you, someone had, was out of order, it was put down. And everyone knew so, where the boundaries were, hmm. but they just weren't written on walls. It wasn't like that. Dino set a culture, the, the players, those Jonos, Cosers, Cockers, wigs, you know, there's such a, so many leaders there that just bossed it, didn't they? Yeah, and you've had a few different environments, I suppose, now. Um, Northampton being your third environment, so Worcester, England for a little bit, and then Northampton, am I right in saying? Yeah. So out, out of them environments that you've had, Worcester, I mean, well, they've been, they've been a, tr- a club that have struggled, but they've also produced a lot of good players. So how was your time with Worcester, then into that England setup, and now into a much kind of bigger role, a bigger team, no disrespect to, to Worcester, and more of a hands-on role seemingly. How's that been? Um, mate, I've had a great transition. I, I finished at 31, and um, a friend of both of ours, Dean Ryan, gave me my first job. Um, first time I met, I went, I went and had a beer with Hoggy in uh, Cheltenham, Jim. Carl Hogg. Yeah, yeah, Carl Hogg. That, um, that was my interview. And um, obviously past that. And I actually got the job I got was, you'll love this, transition coach um, at Worcester. So I was basically looking after the um, academy, the kids coming out of the academy and before they were sort of first team guys and trying to upskill, um, and up, upskill those. So off the back of that, I got started, I did that for a year and a half and then became the uh, got the job in the first team backs coach and loved that and enjoyed that and um, off the back of that Eddie was looking for a skills coach just for a summer summer job and I was obviously free over the summer and um, discussed it with Worcester and got an opportunity to go out there to Argentina with him and and run the run the skills and get involved with the backs um, for that tour, and that was that was that was eye opening. That was because the level of ex, the expectation level that you set, um, and anything that falls under that, you call out. And this was, I mean, Eddie Eddie wouldn't accept. He had it had to this the standard had to be up here physically, um, skill wise, you know, in all aspects. Um, um, Discipline-wise, all of that had to. There was if if anything fell below that, you knew about it. And I think all, I think good coaches. I think that's the one thing that all good coaches do. They set high standards, and then then they I say call out, but they 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 don't accept anything un, underneath that. That is not acceptable. Now you can do that in very different ways. You can do that in an encouraging way. You can do that in a hardball way, like Cockers. We all know, and I think lots of people would know how Cockers would react to 
certain situations where it would be right that's not good enough you're blah, blah, blah. and you can do it in that way and you but you can also do it in a right we need to strive to be better by doing a b c and you know there are lots of different ways but they all good coaches set standards and people have to strive for them and um i think that's what he did very well and um yeah the the, te- the, the, hit, hit, the thing with eddie that i was enlightening for me is i I saw a way of, I saw a quite a traditional way of coaching um, having through as a player by loads of different coaches through Leicester and when I was at Bath as well. Loads of different traditional. And by traditional, I mean, um, we go from a drill to another drill um, where there are lots of cones around and actually it can be quite slow and then there'll be periods of it it goes fast but then you walk to the back of the queue and then you do something else and and I just thought that wasn't the right way about doing things and then I went into Eddie's sessions and they're just fast you're moving around from here they're all very games based um but then there's still this real high expectation level you then jump out to do something that is a drill like a maybe a tackle job it's bang 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 and then you're back in to go and do another games based thing that has people constantly um practicing really purposefully so we're like practicing at the top level not nothing sort of in this lower just easy easy bit and that was the real eye-opener for me and i think that's what i've strived for ever since really yeah, and that's the thing. I think that some people are suited to an environment like that. And mm. ultimately, as you know, and you, and you probably know better than me, having um, seen what it takes to be a top-level coach, is that some people can't hack that, can they? I think there's a, a short window of where you can deal with that stress and that pressure and then having to back it up and the, the questions being asked. So th- this is why I think Leicester are going to do really well because Borthwick has been in that environment with Japan and we saw what Japan did in the 2015 World Cup phenomenal he's obviously obviously been working with the Lions, but also recently with eddie jones so i just wanted to touch on that but now you're at northampton chris boyd has gone out to the world not that there's any other english coaches all over the world but there might well be some in argentina who knows and he's gone out to try and find the best young <sighs> you 38 39 40 young england coach and he's found you but how have you found your relationship with him and his ambition and standards um, yeah, so our, Boydie, uh, we started talking over like this over um, Skype when he was still back in New Zealand looking for a job, and we just clicked on how we viewed the game, how we see the game, how we see attack, um, and the mindset of what we wanted to see on the pitch. And um, so I was, you know, we clicked really well and have done ever since. We're very similar in our. Um, views on how the game can be played and how we want to play the game and luckily for me he uh, he backed me to deliver the attack for Northampton and the the, the real thing about uh, beauty about Boydie is that he's he's uh, he doesn't man manage us but then in any time we could go and ask for help but and but also would be pushed by him as well so a real good balance between that's your job go and sort it um if you need any help i'm here but also pushing you asking you questions to see to help you get along that path so um no love really enjoy working with boydie as um uh, and i think the culture that he brought over to a we had to sort of change a mindset at um, Northampton that was possibly a little bit. Um, Northampton been very successful with a strong pack, strong scrum, more, and that game. Yet that game didn't probably suit the set of players that we had um, and who were trying to play that game. So we sort of looked at it in a different way, and everyone was so on board to try and play a more fluent game. So we had um, Dan Bigger on the podcast with, with Goody. I thought he was, I, I've not heard Dan speak that much. I've just seen his demeanor on the pitch, having played against him. I uh, love the bloke. He's one of my favorite players. And when he came to the Premiership, I was really excited. Um, the big thing I wanted to talk about and get your understanding of what it takes to make it at that kind of level. And I'm sure there's probably about 5 million kids watching this lockdown yeah. show, so they could be interested to know, is 
you talk about mindset and you also talk about players that are elite. And this is why I spoke about the England thing with you. So Chris Boyd came out recently and likened Dan Bigger to Michael Jordan, which is a huge, huge statement, right? Because Michael Jordan's arguably the best athlete the world yeah. has ever seen. Muhammad Ali is obviously up there as well. Jim Hamilton and Mike Tyson. See, I threw my name in there quickly. <laughs> um, so what kind of skill sets does Dan have? I know what he's brought to the team. He's, he's mentioned that, but maybe you can talk a bit, a yeah. bit about that. Why such a big statement for a quality, quality player that's clearly added yeah. value to the environment? Yeah, he does a huge, huge value. Um, Dan is the most, he is so competitive, so very competitive, so driven and sets his own, talk about where his standards are. And I think that's, all, like Michael Jordan came out of that documentary with a few, um, a few haters, which that's what, that's what elite sport often looks like. He's setting a standard that's there. Now, his demeanour to, when people fell below that, he probably was a pretty cutthroat and, you know, he, there are different ways to get people above that line. And he chose a, a lead way. Dan's, Dan sets standards and, um, and lets you know if you're not up to those, if you're not up to those standards. But it does it in a much um, better way than Michael Jordan does. But he's very much that guy that, um, um, that, you know, as I say, sets those standards out. Back to our Leicester days, that, that was, that's when we talk about being peer driven. That's what all those guys did. They set the standards and if you fell under it, you knew about it and you had to pull your socks up. And Dan's got where he's got. I think he'd be the first to tell you that he's um, not the world's best athlete and he's not, um, it doesn't float his boat, you know, the athletic side of it, but he has got one stubborn head on him. And he, if he sets his mind to doing something, he's going to do it. And, you know, talk about what's the most important trait in any, if you want to play a league sport, that is it. I, can, I think that is the most important thing. Yeah, 100%. Uh, on that point as well, and we'll come back to the balance of the Northampton team. So you mentioned that's a trait, and, and that's maybe a trait more in your coaching capacity. What would be your perfect player? What three things are you looking for? Oh, wow, that is a that is a tough question. Um, it doesn't I need would, to be three things. It doesn't need to be three no, things. Right. It can I, just be. I would put th th things that I find I think really make things tick. Now it's position specific and all of that. You can change it around. But first off, you've got to be a competitor. First off, you have to be a competitive, just competitor in. Everything you're doing, you just have to compete, compete, compete. And I think you get that trait, it pushes you up in lots of the others. Now, my, I think you need different types of players on the rugby pitch at any time, especially in the modern game. You need athletes that can go and beat people. Monster and people. Monster them. You can monster them. And how you do that, you can go over someone, you can go around them, you can step them. Um, the, you know, athletes. So you've got these guys. So I think you have to, you're either one of these, well, not, you're not either one of these, but these guys, or you need to be able to be really good at finding people's space. So a facilitator. So someone in our team would be a George Furbanks, who's a, not the world's biggest guy. He's not the world's rapidest guy. He's, he's sharp, but, um, but he's very good at giving other people space. And we've got a good few of those. Rory Hutchinson's very good at that. Um, you know, Has Mal's very good at that, those, those guys. So um, I think those, and I, the way I term that are, they're games players. So if you put them in a basketball game, they would still see the space and be able to get the, the right guy who was in space the ball. Now they may not be brilliant at the skill of it, but that because it's, a different skill but they'll see the game they've got vision to it and I think those guys and are truly um, they're the ones you really look for and the, the ones I really look for so if you're a young kid now um, the way I think you get better at that is just going out and playing games not net, not just rugby games go play any game and play as much as you can but make sure you've always got your head up and looking where the space is and um, what I really, 
I don't like in coaching of younger kids, and I'm and hopefully we're getting away from this nowadays, is just that big bully guy who can just go and run over someone. Because when you get to a certain age, there's very few and few of those guys that can still do that in the premiership. And actually, even those guys, you look at someone like Skelton who can probably do that, he's still got some great skills, hasn't he? He still knows mm-hmm. when to move the ball and I think um, and when to put a bit of feet on it, a bit of step and that. Um, so I think working on those finer sort of games playing skills are, are absolutely key. When you were talking, Jimbo, earlier about what you wish you could have got better at, or what you, how you would have run your done, what would you have done in your career differently? What what would you have done? Well, Vesti, if you were my coach, the way you were speaking, I reckon I would have been a three-time British and Irish Lion. Um, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, but I have a couple. I've got a, a couple of regrets actually. So, like, I played this certain way, right, that worked, and a lot of that stems from Leicester. And I was in a mindset where you had to be hard as nails, right, whether or not you felt that way on that given day, but you had to give yeah. that kind of persona, the enforcer kind of persona. And it was all that brutality and physicality hurt people, right? You get to a ruck and no technique, you fly in there with your head and whatever happens, I, the ideal scenario is that skittles go everywhere and there's quick, you know? And, you know, but there was a large part of me, right, that I, in the background quietly, even now, pride, prided myself, pride myself on being fit, right? Because there's nothing worse than going, and I've gone into games where I'm not fit. There's nothing worse than going into games and you're hanging. You've been out of the piss all no. day and you're not in the right kind of space. But you, there's nothing better than being on the pitch and you are so fit that you're enjoying it. Because if you're not fit and you're playing, you're hating it, aren't you? Why are you yeah. for? <laughs> I was just thinking about you. That's, <laughs> have you ever told the story of you and Abo on the, uh, the rowers on oh. Sunday? Mate, what was your memory of that? What was your memory of the rowing machines? I can tell you if it's right or not. Um, 2K row, every 500 metres, neck of pint. Ne- neck of can, yeah. Neck of can. And I've got, I remember I've seen, a bit, I've seen someone, either someone puking in the, I think Harry might have been puking in the bin and he wasn't even doing it. <laughs> they were Leicester days, mate. So we give them a bit of a Were you dressed as the... Uh, the jailbird. Then. Yeah, well, I was in jail the night before. Me and, Sarah, yeah, me, me, <laughs> me and the late Sarah Rambini got arrested um, for an oh, altercation sorry. that I tried to... Uh, for Kate. Yeah. yeah, you were the so, goodie. You were always good. the goodie, Jimbo. I know, exactly. So, yeah, that was right. I got a PB on the row machine, 2K row, in about, <laughs> yeah, in, in about 5 minutes 30, which is a world record. So, it's out there somewhere. I've chosen to forget about them days. But moving forward, so one of the, one of the big things, if I look... Yeah my career is what I wish I did more and you meant and you said it there and you said it's certainly there right is look up yeah right? so I, and this is more as an international player so I would be in the changing rooms batting my chest <gasps> going nuts right at the players um, and I just wanted all out physicality so I'd be in the mm-hmm. tunnel right and the emotion was over me 20 minutes into the game I am fucked yeah <laughs> I am absolutely yeah. blowing right and I've got and even though I've done the training all week or whatever, I've almost lost my way in terms of, you know, like how to bring myself back to that moment. So if I had my time again, right, and I did this towards the, towards the end of my career, playing for Scotland, playing for Saracens, because I knew I was coming towards the end, is that I wanted to go out there and enjoy it. And enjoy it meant yeah. look up. So I'll take it all in. When I've got the anthems, don't get too emotional. Um, when the first kickoff goes up, not looking to absolutely blitz someone, but looking to, for someone to make the tackle, then the charge down, then yeah. thinking about the lineup. So I start to process things. And I'll tell you what, I was significantly better for it. My three years at Saracens, yeah. arguably past my peak, um, best of ever played. Yeah. So I, I think that's um, t- like such an important thing now, I reckon. We talk about, I think it's so important, calm heads make good decisions. Rattled heads don't, you know, they may be able to clear a rook out, but they're not going to make a good decisions at other things. But also, you do need that physicality as well, don't you, Jimbo? Mm. But you've got, to, so you've got to balance it. Yeah. Uh, not an easy one. Um, I, my, my, um, my, crit, 
my sort of criticism of the way I think the Premiership was coached back when we played in it was, and I think this is sort of your point at Sarah's, but before that, most of the week was spent organising for the weekend. So you must have gone through a million different lineouts Monday, Tuesday, gotten down Thursday for this weekend that you're going to get, that you're going to go and use them on. Or, and we're going to do this play, the backs are going to do this bit, and then we're going to do this. It was all very, almost like a dress rehearsal for a theatre production. So you're going to go and stand here, you're going to see the kickoff in this format, you're going to do all that. Now, all those things, you need to do a level of organisation. But my criticism would be, how much of that week were we getting better as rugby players? Mm. And I, I don't, I'm not sure we were getting, I'm not sure how often we were getting told to look up, catch the ball early to give you a little bit more time, and, but actually sp spend time doing it and getting better at playing rugby and, and making decisions. And um, I think one of my big um, drivers is what I really enjoy is, is people getting better every day at rugby. And then we have to do the organisation on top. We have to set up what the kickoff formation looks like. You have to do things like that. But it isn't the be-all and end-all. The be-all and end-all is players getting better for me. 